Hola, this is Gigi Saul Guerrero from Lucha Gore Productions, and you're listening to Without Your Head. Let's get started. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neil, and I'm joined by Steve Mitchell, the co-writer of Chopping Mall, one of my favorites, and the director of King Cohen. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How about you? Excellent. Excellent. Now, I've always been a, a huge fan of Larry Cohen uh, films, and um, so I was very excited to watch this. It was very cool because I learned a lot more about his career than, than, than I knew of, because I really knew of him from like the 70s and 80s horror movies, and I didn't know uh, he had such a, such a vast uh, uh, career. Yeah, well, that's kind of how the movie got started. Uh, I was looking at his IMDb page, and I was kind of overwhelmed by the amount of credits of his I didn't know. I mean, I knew most of the f- features. I knew a fair amount of his TV series stuff. But he had done so many more, I think, TV movies or other things, that, you know, like non-feature things uh, that I was not aware of. And then I looked at his, uh, especially his screenplays. I mean, the amount of screenplays that he wrote uh, was uh, just it kind of overwhelmed me, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And yeah. it was sort of then that I had the idea that maybe there's a movie here, you know, maybe this career, which is, was already to me, very interesting, uh, mm-hmm. deserved, uh, you know, Larry deserved maybe a little time in the spotlight. I know Roger Corman had had a documentary done about him and, you know, listen, Larry is every bit as valid as Roger. And in some ways, perhaps even more because Larry's a triple hyphenate. He's a writer, producer, and director where mm-hmm. Roger was primarily a producer and director, not the sort of, compare apples to oranges or anything sure. like that. But, you know, the impulse that I had was that, you know, maybe Larry deserved a movie. So that's kind of where it got started. Mm-hmm. Now, did you know Larry at all before uh, you wanted to do the documentary? Had you worked with him? Personal, personally, no, no. It was just one of those things where, you know, I had the idea and then I said, all right, well, how do I make this thing happen? And I think the first thing I needed to do was, get in touch with Larry and then see if he even wanted the documentary made. Cause somebody had right. written a book about him. I think it, I don't remember who the author was, but I think it came out from McFarland or scarecrow press. And I had read the book. Um, but I knew somebody who knew Loreen land and, um, and I met Loreen, uh, and I think at a collector show out here. And I mentioned that I was interested in doing a movie and she gave me Larry's phone number. And, um, you know, I sort of took a bunch of deep breaths and girded my loins and just said, okay, well, I guess I got to make this phone call. And I called him up and he answered the phone. And I said, I was who I was and I was interested in doing what I was interested in doing. And he said, come on up to the house. And so I went to the famous house and he made me a cup of coffee and gave me a couple of cookies. And I said, I want to do a movie. And he said, he said, I'm very flattered and I'll help you any way. I'll help you any way I can if you can get it financed. And Mm -hmm. I said, great. And then we sort of moved on from there. And, um, you know, it took a while to get the picture financed. You know, getting Mm -hmm. anything financed is like, you know, climbing Mount Everest. But Mm -hmm. we did get it financed. and. um, Larry was good to his work. He did help me any way he could. Yeah. Now, did he, um, did he have any input like on the direction of the documentary? Did he let you pretty much do your own thing? He let me do my own thing. Um, I think it was, if it was up to Larry, it would have been done as a mini series because, you know, <laughs> there's so yeah. much that we covered in the interviews and there's so much work that he had mm-hmm. done. You know, he'd also written a number of plays, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, and none of that stuff is really reflected on his IMDb page. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm sure Larry would have said, you know, uh, okay, I'm going to do my bad Larry impersonation. But he says, why don't you do it as a miniseries? There's plenty to talk about. <laughs> and, in, and in point of fact, when we did the interviews, I think I did. I think I had somewhere between 15 and 20 hours of interview footage with Larry alone. Mm. So there was a lot, there was a lot, but ultimately, uh, you know, he let us make the movie that, that, uh, we, we all, that we wound up making. I mean, you know, for me, this wasn't about the anecdotes. This was about creating Mm -hmm. a portrait of a creative artist and, Mm -hmm. you know, through his career, 
you know, we could get to know who he is, how he thought, what he did, what he was about. Um, and, you know, that's really, I think, the strength of the movie. You know, mm-hmm. it's a portrait of somebody. It's not just, you know, analog, uh, an anecdote, analog, listen to me, anecdote mm-hmm. after anecdote and story after story. Not that the stories aren't great and there's mm-hmm. a lot I couldn't use. It's, it's really about Larry at the end of the day. And that was, that was sort of my guiding, you know, you know, focus or purpose, you mm-hmm. know, to tell Larry's story, you know, through his work. Yeah. And really, uh, it seems like, um, a big part of Larry is, is creating cause he's, he's has, uh, ideas are stuck all over the walls and just the plethora of stuff that he's put out and prize scripts that he's written. That's never been made. And, it's pretty wild to think that uh, he's ha- he's has so many ideas, and for for over so many decades. Like you would think, you know, some people might have a lot of cool ideas to begin with, and then afterwards maybe they don't do too much. But it seems like he never runs out of ideas. Well, you know, the thing about Larry is that, uh, as I think uh, it was either Joe Dante or, or uh, John Landis who said, you know, he's an idea machine. Mm-hmm. You know, Larry has so many ideas, you know, so many original ideas. Um, that's not a problem. The other thing is he's, I, my nickname for him is the energizer bunny because he just keeps going and going and going. Yeah. And he's just really a force of will and to some degree, mm-hmm. a force of nature. You know, he is a creative artist. This is what he does. I mean, I know a lot of writers. I'm a writer myself and I don't mm-hmm. think I've ever met anybody who was as fertile to quote John Landis as Larry is. I mean, he just looks at the world and the world looks back at him and somehow he gets ideas and stories, uh, which, mm-hmm. you know, he is able to take from a sort of a, uh, you know, uh, sort of a general idea and turn them into movies. And, uh, he does so with, <laughs> Great originality based on saving money and based on, you know, not getting permits and all, you know, I mean, his process as a director in many ways serves his uh-huh. creativity as a writer. I mean, he is, he is a very synergist, synergistic and a kind of creative force. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just the, I love all that stuff too. Seeing how, you know, um, there's a lot about it, like us uh, dealing shots, not getting permission to show parades and all that stuff. And, I don't know if you can get away with a lot of that stuff anymore, but it's really, it's really fun to watch and to hear people talk about. His movies were a product of the times that they were made, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, that, that the Larry of the seventies would not be the Larry of today. You simply Mm -hmm. couldn't make movies the way he did. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and with the kind of material that, that he did, I mean, in hell up in Harlem where they're having that fight at the, at LAX, you know, our big airport out here uh, mm-hmm. and doing it without permits and stuff like that. Forget it. You'd be, if you even started doing that, you would be arrested immediately <laughs> and probably thrown in some closet somewhere to rot. Mm-hmm. Um, you just can't get away with what he got away with back in the day. And, and again, that goes to um, the sort of spirit of filmmaking. You know, one of the, the themes that became obvious to us when we were cutting it is that Larry represents an approach to filmmaking that doesn't exist anymore. And to Mm -hmm. some degree, um, movies are suffering a little bit because of that. You know, the whole idea of the the renegade spirit and throwing stuff against the wall and see if it sticks, you know, there's something Mm -hmm. very spontaneous and very original about that. And today, even, you know, even at lower budget levels, my God, if, you know, if you don't succeed, the sky falls on top of you. I mean, it's it's an amazing environment right now because even though the technology is there to support filmmaking at every you know budgetary stage and level, mm-hmm. um, you know the, the ideas might not be as interesting, the acting might not be as good. I mean, there are any number of reasons why the n- movies today, which are very technically uh, uh, impressive, even at a very mm-hmm. low budget level, are just not as creatively impressive as they mm-hmm. were back in the day. And I think, you know, Larry's early movies, I think, are very raw around the edges, and that kind of gives them a, a Larry Cohen flavor. But, you know, 
they're not terribly well made by today's standards, but you know, they are all part and parcel and all of a piece. They are a Larry Cohen film. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I kind of miss that stuff. Yeah, definitely. There's a feel for, uh, out of movies of that era, especially like uh, the, the ones like uh, kind of New York uh, kind of movies uh, from bigger mm-hmm. to small, like Taxi Driver, The Chud, and uh, all of them have that mm-hmm. kind of gritty feel, a basket case. And uh, I don't know, there's something about them that is very special, I think. Yeah, you know, they're, they're not labored. They're very, they're very spontaneous. They're very, you know, they're from the gut, mm-hmm. I think. Um, you know, today, careers are made uh, or, or, or I think maybe the word I'm looking for is lost based on maybe one picture. You only get one chance to make a first impression. I mean, and that was on my mind with Ken Cohen. I mean, we took a long time to cut it and we really, you know, wanted to, uh, refine it as much as possible and, um, you know, have the story, the overall story and portrait work as best as we could make it because let's face it, it, it every movie is kind of a portfolio piece and um and and even many careers these days are based on not the quality of the material but the success mm-hmm. and um you know so it's the stakes are much higher i guess is what i'm trying to say now mm-hmm. for filmmakers than they were back in the day back in the day theaters needed to be filled so this was great for somebody like Larry. I mean, it's amazing when you, when you think about it, when I think about it, I grew up in New York city and, you know, there are an awful lot of theaters in times square that needed to be filled with product. And if Mm. you could make halfway decent product, you got into theaters, Mm. not the way it's done today. It's much, it's a much different world. I think in some ways it's better. And I think some ways it's not quite so good, quite as good. Yeah. So what was the what was the first Larry Cohen movie you saw, or the first one that like uh, stuck with you? I think it was It's Alive. I think on the re, on the reissue mm-hmm. in uh, I think it was what seventy six or something like that when they reissued it with the uh, that great tagline. There's there's something wrong with the Davis baby. It's alive, you know that whole mm-hmm. thing. Um, yeah. I was somewhat familiar with Larry's name from credits of his I'd seen on television, you know, TV primarily. Um, but I'm a credits junkie. You know, I, I love knowing who was responsible for what. And at the end of the day, uh, it's one of those things where I'm going, well, oh, Larry Cohen, this guy's interesting. So I would always <laughs> look out. I was always look out for anything that he did after it's live came out. And mm-hmm. I saw most of his movies, theatrically um, from that point on because I was always looking for his movies uh, Hoover uh, barely played in New York City so I was not really aware of that picture until many years later when I think mm-hmm. it played on I think the CBS late night movie or something like that and mm-hmm. you know I watched FBI movies and I saw so there was a Larry Cohen movie right out of the gate and I said oh I'm watching this <laughs> um, and then a couple of his other movies like special effects and perfect strangers. I think I saw on home video or cable, but mm-hmm. you know, anytime I could go see a Larry Cullen movie, I would go see him. Yeah. Let's real quick about the credits. Um, I'm, I like to watch credits myself and, uh, like, uh, so like Netflix now, like as soon as the movie's over, they throw like the, uh, the credits up into a little tiny corner. So you can't even see them. And I think even on some cable channels they like fast forward the credits so like they're super fast so like it's impossible to you know actually sit down and read them and uh plus i, I like to listen to the music at the end i always think after you watch a movie it's kind of cool just to sit there and uh kind of soak in the music and think about the movie you watch so i think it it's too bad that a lot of the credits now are like being uh pushed to the side so you you, you can't really watch them unless you're in the theater yeah, you and I are kindred spirits on that. I mean, I'm always I'm always curious to know at least the major credits, you know, who the art director mm-hmm. was, the cinematographer, the editor, the you know, especially the composer, because I'm a big film music fan. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I also like to know where something was shot. Usually those, you know, you can piece that together based on looking at a lot of the end titles. You know, mm-hmm. they'll be say it'll say art director, you know, parentheses Louisiana or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, the attitudes 
towards credits and certainly, you know, end title music is not, is not what I grew up with, not what I can appreciate. Um, I miss that stuff. I miss, I also, you know, I think that scoring these days in most movies is not terribly good. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I grew up at a time when I had Jerry Goldsmith and John Williams and John Barry and Ennio Marconi and a lot with Schifrin and Jerry Fielding. And there are very few guys today who I think are really, you know, anywhere close to the guys that I was see. I was you know, listening to their music on a routine basis, you mm-hmm. know, um, you know, nowadays, I mean, I used to go see certain movies literally because the composer did it. Mm-hmm. And now that's almost never the case. But anyway, we're digressing from Larry. Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, that's fine. So I uh, see so at 15 to 20 hours, you said of just, you know, Larry Cohen, uh, how, 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 like, um, over how much period of time did you, did you film with him? I assume it wasn't, you know, just sat down for 15 hours. And talk uh, <laughs> no, we did. <laughs> I think we did four sessions and I think I picked up a couple of questions. Um, I think when, when we shot the interview with his wife, I think I shot a few things that day with him. And then I went to his place and did, uh, you know, B roll, uh, of him in the house. Uh, I think I got some stuff of him, uh, you know, sitting in his little office and he was talking to me and stuff like that. Uh, so I think all of the material that I did with Larry covered about five, um, I think it was five sessions, but they were basically three major interview sessions. I think there was the first one Well, there were two indoors. No, there were four sessions. There, there was, there was the first day uh, where he sort of is sitting in the th- his throne chair and it's the overall color temperature is kind of warmish. And then there was the second interior day where we're sitting next to his piano. Then we shot a day out by the pool. So you can see the house, the famous mm-hmm. house. And then I think I shot another day uh, where he was also in his living room. So there were four major interview days. And then there was, uh, uh, you know, one day, like I said, I did a couple of questions. Uh, and then I, I had a, 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 what we call B-rolls. You know, I was following him around the house and, and you know, getting some you know, other stuff. And that was pretty late in the production. You know, that was one of those things where my editor and I said, you know, we could use some something else, some extra stuff. Mm-hmm. So I just hopped over there with my smartphone and did most of that stuff uh, without any crew whatsoever, just with my mm-hmm. smartphone in hand. Like I said, there was the some technology, stuff, yeah. the technology is getting, you know, is getting really good these days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there was uh, some stuff from like a uh, convention, I think, too, that was in there. Yeah, we we followed him around at uh, I think it was the convention was called Horror Hound, and that took place mm-hmm. in Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. And um, I just basically I had a camera, and I followed him around, you know, for for uh, the better part of three days. I, yeah. you know, you know, I just, I just said, well, wherever Larry goes, I'm going to follow him. And, you know, that's what you do when you make one of these pictures. There's just a lot of shooting and hunting and gathering and just, you know, getting material because the movie is going to be made in the editing room. The narrative is going to be created in the editing room and you just want to have as many pieces as you can. The other thing is that, you know, when we started cutting it, I said to my editor, I said, you know, Everybody has ADD. And my editor said, I don't have ADD. And I said, the, the hell you don't. You know, we all have it. It's because of life in the 21st century. You know, we're so used to seeing so much, you know, coming at us at all, all the time that mm-hmm. we almost have, we don't have any patience for anything, you know, because we're, mm-hmm. we're just absorbing stuff. Uh, and so I said that, you know, I don't want this thing cut like, you know, we're a bunch of monkeys on donuts and and caffeine. You know, I don't want it to have a crazy (laughs) rhythm, but I do want it to have a rhythm where everything, you know, someone is seeing something new, literally, you know, all the time, new images, new, new content, new quotes, new stories, 
you know, mm -hmm. clips. I mean, that's the way you have to make a movie for the 21st century because people get bored very easily. Mm -hmm. Very easily. It's amazing. And, uh, you know, you have to work with that. So that being said, we just needed to have as much material as possible to work with. And that's, mm -hmm. and that's why I had as much as I did. Yeah. So, um, I don't mean this in a negative way, but Larry seems, uh, especially as you, as you watch it, you know, as, as it goes on, he seems very, uh, happy to talk about himself. And, uh, but I find it endearing. I, I like that about him. And then there is a quote later on. So someone says, maybe it's him himself. That you have to have, like you know, confidence to uh, uh, to be successful. And so, uh, anyway, uh, so what what do you think of Larry himself just being around him? Well, he's a he's an interesting human being. That's that's just mm -hmm. for starters. He's very entertaining. You know, he has the spirit of a stand up comedian. You know, he's always telling jokes. In a sense, mm -hmm. Larry is always on stage. Um, you know, the, let's face it; he's got a healthy ego. But I think sure, you need sure, to have yeah. that. Um, mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's based on believing in yourself. I mean, one of my very best friends said to me uh, when I had the idea for the, for the documentary, he says, you think anybody really cares about, him, you know, about Larry Cohen? You, know, you think anybody really wants to see a movie about him? And I said, yes, <laughs> because I'm the audience and I was interested in seeing it. You know, anything that I ever do, um, I'm kind of the audience for the material. And if I think it's going to fly for me, then my thinking is usually, well, maybe it might fly for somebody else. Yeah. And I think Larry, you know, Larry has some of that. Uh, what he brings to the dance is, is, is he has confidence in, um, in himself and his ideas. And let's face it, he wrote, produced, and directed, I think, 20 movies. Mm -hmm. on his own you know i think he did one or two that were produced by other people but i think he did 20 movies that he wrote produced and directed more or less that's that's mm -hmm. based on that's on that, that's let me start that over again it's based on confidence and larry has a mm -hmm. lot of confidence larry has a lot of belief in himself and i think ultimately that is uh you know what any filmmaker needs to really get through the day and get the job done mm -hmm. So there's obviously like huge names in this Martin Scorsese and JJ Abrams and uh was did you find that people were like uh happy to to be part of it and wanting to talk about uh Larry? Yeah, generally sure, yeah. I mean, um uh I never met Martin Scorsese. Um we spent months trying to get the interview set up and I was prepared at a moment's notice to get on a plane you know, a red eye at midnight to fly to New York for, for nine o'clock in the morning interview. Sure. If that's what it took, uh -huh. I would have mm -hmm. been bleary eyed, but I would have done it. And, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Scorsese was aware of the project and kept talking to his staff saying, what's happening with the Larry Cohen thing What's happening with Larry Cohen thing. And he was getting ready to go to, I think, uh, Asia to shoot silence. Mm -hmm. And, he said, uh, how can we get this done? And so what they suggested was I send him uh, questions and he would have one of his New York guys shoot it. And that's how we got it. And so we sent, I sent him, I don't know, about 30 questions or something like that. And he an answered a bunch of them and sent the footage back to us. And, you know, uh, we couldn't have been happier or more grateful. And, you know, he really does help tell Larry's story in a lot of different sequences. In fact, mm -hmm. most of what he sent, or a good chunk of what he sent, we used. You know, I'd be a fool not to. Um, um, but he was very enthusiastic, and he wanted to do it. JJ, uh, ultimately, Larry got us JJ, because Larry called JJ up. And so JJ ultimately uh, was very happy to do uh, what turned out to be the intro to the picture. Mm -hmm. And I think JJ, in many ways, sets the movie up in a great way. Um, and then most everybody else we talked to, they, you know, they talked to us cause they wanted to, if they didn't want to talk to us, they did. Um, mm -hmm. we tried getting, I wanted to get Joel Schumacher, but Schumacher was going through some, I think, weird personal stuff, you know, and, and, uh, he didn't want to talk to anybody with a camera. I mean, uh, he was going through, I think a rough patch, uh, he was getting some bad press about something. 
And mm-hmm. so he was he wasn't willing to talk to us. Um, mm-hmm. Sharon Farrell almost talked to us, but she decided not to. Um, and then uh, I tried getting Tony Lobianco, but I guess maybe I wasn't persistent enough. But everybody who talked to us wanted to talk to us. You know, everybody mm-hmm. that, that we talked to is you know likes Larry. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, Yafikoto uh, is very fond of Larry. He's very indebted to Larry, and he doesn't talk to anybody. He told us that Roger Moore asked him uh, to talk to somebody for a Bond documentary. And he asked wow. said no. But <laughs> he, he talked to us because he liked Larry. And Larry helped yeah. us get Yafit. And Yafit's mm-hmm. a very interesting guy. Um, and it turned out to, to be a pretty good interview. We got some good stuff yeah. with him. Um, uh-huh. He's a character. And, you know, Moriarty, we had to we had to find Moriarty because Moriarty didn't have any representation. Uh, and we're going, man, if we can't get Moriarty, I mean, Moriarty is a very important component yes. in his career. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. I was very happy to see him in it. Yeah. And uh, it was interesting. This is why Facebook is a good thing. Uh, there's a mm-hmm. magazine called Cinema Retro, and they, they did a profile on, on, on Moriarty one day, and they were talking about this. He writes for a political blog. And I said, oh, gee, maybe oh, if I wow. email the, the blog, <laughs> maybe that can get me to Moriarty. Because like I said, he doesn't have any representation. <laughs> so I sent the blog, uh, uh, the editor of the blog an email. And literally 24 hours later, the phone rang. And I knew Moriarty was in Canada. And it was mm-hmm. a Canadian, you know, something from Canada uh, came up on the screen on my smartphone. And I said to my editor, because we were cutting, I said, oh, man, I wonder if this is Moriarty. So I say, hi, this is Steve. And then I hear, hello, Steve, Michael Moriarty, how are you? And I said, I'm thrilled to hear from you. I've been looking everywhere for you. He goes, well, now you've found me. <laughs> and and uh, ultimately, uh, we went to Canada and we did our interview with Moriarty. I mean, he's a delightful guy. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very, I'm very fond of him. I don't know him profoundly well, but mm-hmm. you know the time we spent together, and then he was also he, uh, came into the uh, he came to Montreal for the uh, premiere screening at Fantasia that we had last year. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, there's kind of a Moriarty Cohen uh, reunion thing going on. So, you know, I got to uh, you know we had dinner together one night, and we had uh, I think lunch together the next day or something. So I got to spend some time with Moriarty, and and you know, like I said, it's kind of a delightful time. Yeah, and he's the actor that I most associate with Larry Cohen movies because <clears throat> he's from the movies that I grew up watching, uh, the stuff and and Q the Wing Serpent. And, sure, uh, of course. <clears throat> yeah. No, honestly, well, the stuff my favorite five, Larry Cohen five, movie. They did five. They did five movies together too. You know? Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, and he really elevate not because I love his Larry Cohen movies anyway, uh, but the, he has such great scores, and then he has like you know real uh, you know really talented actor like Michael Moriarty in the movies, and I think it elevates uh, the movies where the premise you know might be like a like a B movie, but it you know elevates the movies into something uh, more than that. Well, Larry's got a pretty good eye for, towards casting. And, you know, Larry was very clever about how he got all these really good actors in his pictures. Um, but Larry's also a guy who, you know, takes advantage of the moment. You know, like, you have that great story in the uh, in the picture where, you know, Larry and Lorraine are having lunch, and, you know, they're having lunch in Moriarty's, you know, at, at the restaurant, like a table or two away. And Larry <laughs> just said, well, let me see if this guy wants to be in my next movie. I mean, you know, Larry's got balls. You know, he, he just, <laughs> he, uh, you know, he goes for it. And, uh, you know, I'm so glad that he did, and because, you know, the stuff that he did with Moriarty was great. And Q is my favorite picture of his. He's that's really primarily because it's it's anchored by that great Moriarty performance. Mm-hmm. So uh, July twenty seventh is a theatrical release for uh, King Cohen. Um, but you, uh, when you watched it uh, at other screenings with an audience, uh, how did uh, how did they go? Well, I got to tell you, it uh, every screening that I've been to with an audience has been uh, you know just a revelation for me. Um, I when we went to Fantasia up in Montreal, that was our first festival, 
And that was going to be the first time the movie was going to be seen with um, uh, strangers, let's say. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I knew the movie was pretty good, or at least I believed it was pretty good. And, you know, my inner circle had pretty much, you know, said nice things about it. You know, people that I trust, people that I know, and they were saying, yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. But, you know, you never know until you see it with an audience. And I think it was just before it got started, I actually started getting a little nervous. And, you know, it went dark, credits came up. And then within the first five minutes, I, I got the feeling that I might be okay because people were laughing in the right places, you know, probably right out of the gate. And uh, about 20 minutes into it, uh, Moriarty, who was sitting in front of me, turns around and he goes, it's wonderful. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> and I'm going, well, maybe, maybe I'm okay. Maybe we'll, maybe we're in good shape. And then when the movie was over, you know, we got a very generous round of applause and, you know, I guess I was able to, you know, let out a sigh of relief. And that's been the response at every festival we've been to. I think I saw it at, at, at I think I've been personally at five festival showings. We, we were in Montreal, London, Austin, Texas, Chicago, and New York. And the response was great. And then we had a big LA sort of cast and crew, friends and family, uh, investors kind of screening at the Cinematheque here in Los Angeles on Hollywood mm -hmm. Boulevard. And then uh, they also uh, sold tickets to fans as well. And the place was packed and the response was great. And as I said to my partners, hey, fellas, guess what? Our movie's playing on Hollywood Boulevard. How about that? <laughs> and it's been very, very gratifying. Everybody seems to really like the movie and, and I couldn't be more pleased um, mm -hmm. because you know something? You may feel good about the movie, but the audience is going to tell you whether or not you're mm -hmm. allowed to feel good about the movie. <laughs> uh -huh. And and the audience, you know, and, and it's, it's also turned out to be kind of an audience picture. It's fun mm -hmm. to watch with an audience. And I think that's mostly because uh, whenever possible, I try to, you know, put in funny stuff. I mean, you know, Larry is a fun guy and a funny guy, and why not try and uh, use as much of that stuff as possible whenever it's you know whenever it's appropriate to tell his story. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, listen, look, look, audiences enjoy enjoy laughing, and uh, uh, and I'm I'm listen, I'm the audience as well. So when we were cutting it, I said to my editor, I said, well, if we can make it funny, let's make it funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had, a, I had a great time watching since I had a smile on my face all the time. And uh, it really made me want to go and, and rewatch uh, the code movies that I, that I know and watch some of the ones I've actually not seen. So I think that's uh, that, that, that it's, it, it did its job. I really, I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you. You know, and your reaction is very similar to the reaction that a lot of people have had. I mean, there are people, some people who saw the film and basically they didn't know Larry's work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people have said, you know, I, I think I want to check out some of his movies. Uh, and then, you know, fans have said, you know, I got to really go back and I got to, I got to revisit a lot of these things. So, uh, you know, one of the, the positives that we're getting from it is that people are just become, have become reinterested in, uh, let's say the Larry Cohen experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they want to go back and check his stuff out. I mean, there's still things of his that I've never seen. Uh, mm -hmm. that I wouldn't mind seeing just kind of for the record. I mean, a lot of it is his TV movie stuff. I mean, and the problem mm -hmm. is not all of that Signing material it. is, is readily available. You know, that's the mm -hmm. one big yeah. kind of gaping hole with, uh, um, uh, you know, home video these days is that for some mm -hmm. reason, uh, there are not a lot of TV movies that are available. And I think that's because of economics. For some reason, people don't want to spend money uh, buying home video uh, on on most TV <laughs> movies, and then mm -hmm. I guess for some reason that stuff doesn't really, you know. I mean, for people that you know, for for networks or channels that run movies, they usually want to run theatrical stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's probably some hidden gems out there in Larry Cohen world that uh, we'll never yeah. get to see. You're also co-writer of Chopping Mall, one of my favorites, and uh, I understand like you didn't necessarily know 
that the movie had such a following until it was uh, something with you and Jim Wynorski. I don't know. I don't know. Years ago, he says, go look. I said, why? He said, don't be amazed. I said, about what? He said, go look. And so I went going to the page, and I saw all of these comments about chopping mall. Uh-huh. And it was, that was the moment where I realized, where I learned that the movie is kind of a cult classic. Mm-hmm. And we never knew back in the day whether or not the movie, uh, that anybody saw the movie, frankly. You know, we, I don't yeah. think we knew how the movie was, was responded to. I mean, it had a, it had somewhat of a theatrical release. I do know it played on Broadway because a couple of friends of mine took a picture of the, uh, the marquee uh, mm-hmm. at the theater was playing on Broadway. And, um, but it wasn't until years and years and years later that everybody kept, you know, kept telling us, Oh man, I love shopping mall. And we had mm-hmm. a screening here at the Egyptian, uh, it was kind of the 29th anniversary screening and it was the restored and remastered version. Uh, which Jim and I were involved with. And, mm-hmm. you know, the place was packed. And the audience went nuts. It was it was just so gratifying that, you know, 29 years later that, you know, we actually kind of got a curtain call. And we were there with almost, I think, all of the cast members. Uh, mm-hmm. Everybody except Susie Slater was there. Mm-hmm. And we couldn't, we couldn't find Susie. But, you know, the other, you know, the other, the other kids, as I call them, we're all there, mm-hmm. and it was great to see them, and it was great that we all kind of got, uh, we kind of got our curtain call that we didn't get uh, 29 years earlier. It was a, it was a lot yeah. of fun. It was it was a, it was a really nice night, and again, the enthusiasm mm-hmm. of the fans was just uh, uh, astonishing to me. I was mm-hmm. just amazed. Yeah, but what you, you know, said earlier uh, about uh, yeah about you know good thing about Facebook is um, you know finding people stuff. And I just was having a conversation with like a younger horror movie fan. And he was, he was saying, um, you know, why do people always say Halloween three is underrated? Like I always see everyone loving it. And I thought about it and I was like, well, I think it's cause you grew up with the internet. So, but like, if you didn't grow up with the internet, like when I was a kid, no one liked Halloween three, but, but me, but then when I got online, you find other people from other areas who also like, you know, these movies that other people might not have liked. So, you know, with the internet, it really, it brings people you know, together who, who love, you know, these, these weird things that might not be appreciated by, you know, everybody. And so it seems like a much smaller world, I think, uh, you know, with the internet. I think that, I think that's certainly a major part of it. I also think that sometimes some movies age into better movies. Um, I, there are a lot of movies that I had seen when I was younger that I was not crazy about. And mm-hmm. then years later, you look at the movies and you go, wow. Um, mm-hmm. You know, sometimes the years can be very cool to a movie, but mm-hmm. then sometimes the years can be very kind to a movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'll give you one quick example. When I was a kid, I hated the original Invasion of Body Snatchers because I never saw the movie that I wanted to see, which was, you know, the National Guard, and the you know, the state police and the... You know, the, you know, uh, the army and all of those guys taking on the aliens. I mean, that's the movie mm-hmm. I wanted to see. And that's not the movie I got to see. So my whole attitude towards that picture was like, yeah, who cares? And of course, one of my friends was a big Don Siegel fan. And I'm a big Don Siegel fan. Uh, he said, you're, mm-hmm. you're such an asshole. All my friends, when, <laughs> you know, when I disagree, they usually say I'm such an asshole. And uh-huh. so some years ago, it was probably... Yeah, about 15 years ago, a friend of mine calls me up one night. He says, come on, we're going to go. We're going to go to the Motion Picture Academy and watch Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And I mm-hmm. said, what, what are you talking about? I said, he said, I said, I want to go see it. I'm not a big fan of that movie. He says, <laughs> and then he says, don't be an asshole. Come on, get out of the house. Come on over. I have tickets. We're going to go see Invasion of the Body Snatchers at the, you know, the Motion Picture Academy, which is mm-hmm. like at the time was one of the best, if not the best theater in Los Angeles. You know, huge state-of-the-art fantastic and i'd never seen the original invasion of the body snatchers on a big screen well it was a revelation for me i i absolutely loved it i realized how wrong i was that's that's number one number two is what i also realized is it's really a great film noir story 
You know, mm-hmm. I always think of film noir as like a guy meets a gal and the gal destroys it. That's, mm-hmm. that's to me what film noir is in a nutshell. Well, even though it's science fiction and a horror movie, it's also a real film noir picture shot in Hollywood, mm-hmm. shot at night, real locations. I mean, it could have been, you know, it could have been a classic crime oriented noir based on the way it was shot but it was so much more. And so now a movie that I didn't care for at one time is a movie I have tremendous enthusiasm and regard for. So, you mm-hmm. know, sometimes the years can be kind, or maybe we just get a little bit smarter uh, <laughs> as we get older. Yeah. And we can see the forest for the trees, you know? Mm-hmm. No, I, yeah, I totally agree with that. There's uh, lots of movies, uh, even like the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I didn't like when I was a kid for some reason. But uh, then I watched it when I was older, and I was like, oh, my God, this is, you know, this amazing movie. So, and then, then there yeah, are movies you know, that I grew up loving, and then I revisit, and I was like, oh, I probably shouldn't have rewatched this as an adult. So, You know, movies are very of the moment. And sometimes the moment, you know, you're, you're in sync with the movie at the moment, and then sometimes you're not. And But generally, I tell you something, and... Uh, this is mostly true. This has remained consistently true. If I kind of liked the movie for one reason or another, when I was young, I still like that movie today. Uh, mm-hmm. that, that somehow that film worked in a very primal way for me. Mm-hmm. And whatever that was, which I'm sure I could not articulate at the time, um, still works for me today. I mean, I'm still as big a fan of the original version. I'm, the, the original version of the thing is my favorite movie of all time. And I've seen mm-hmm. it literally hundreds of times. And every time I see it, it makes me smile. I'm happy to be visiting those characters. I love the picture, but there are other pictures, you know, that I loved as a kid that I still love as an adult many, many, many years later. You know, mm-hmm. I'm still a big fan of the, you know, the beast from 20,000 fathoms. I like all the other Ray Harryhausen pictures. I love, I love you know, Ray Harryhausen. Yeah. You know, pictures like world without end, you know, or I, I still, you know, I, I still kind of adore, um, mm-hmm. if it worked, then they still kind of work today. Very mm-hmm. few movies that I liked. Then I respond to like, what, what was I thinking? Usually what was <laughs> uh-huh. I thinking had more to do with the fact that like, I didn't see, I didn't really see the movie see mm-hmm. the first time, you know, it's the, the invasion of the body snatchers, uh, example. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, years can be kind. Mm-hmm. When, uh, when Harry house uh, died a few years ago, they showed a bunch of his movies at one of our local theaters in, in Boston, um, the Brattle theater. And so, you know, I went to him and I grew up watching him, but I never saw him on the big screen. So, Seeing Jason the Argonauts and the, and the skeleton scene, which I always thought was like the greatest scene as a kid, seen on the big screen, I was like, oh my God, this is you know still so amazing. His movies in the theater are really great experiences. Um, mm-hmm. I, I got to see uh, the piece from 20,000 Fathoms at the uh, Egyptian in Hollywood, where, you know, where the American Center Tech lives. That's their theater. Mm-hmm. And this is a movie I had seen literally dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times. But seeing it in a theater, it was almost a new picture. Mm-hmm. And so if you ever have a chance to see a favorite in a theater, it's always worth making the trip because the yeah. experience would be that much better. I agree. And, I try to tell people on the show because I agree 100% with some theaters in Boston that do midnight movies. And if it's a movie I've seen a million times, there's watching on the, in the, on the big screen is a totally different experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, listen, on that note, I have to go. All but, right. Well, uh, thanks. Hey, it was nice talking with you. I appreciate you coming on. I really enjoyed talking to you, and I love the movie. Oh, well, thank you very much. No, it was my, my pleasure. Hey, this is David Naughton, and you're listening to WithoutYourHead.com.